Okay, well, today we're going to talk about the impacts of overfishing. Uh, and basically, this is an example of the tragedy that comes in the world's oceans, which nobody owns, and this leads to overexploitation. Uh, so basically, uh, seafood is incredibly important to this planet, especially here in Korea. I mean, we eat a lot of seafood here, right? So, so the, there's like over a, a billion people for whom that is their primary source of protein, uh, and it provides 20% of the protein for for you know a significant portion of the world's population. And, you know, there is some farm fish, you know, that we do raise some fish. You know, here in Korea, if you travel around the coastline here, you'll see fish pens. We, there is a bit of, of uh, fish that is raised, like in a farm, essentially. Uh, but most of the world's fish that is sold in stores are still caught in the wild, just in the open oceans, in, in, in the ocean that doesn't really belong to anyone. So there's three different ways in which uh, fishermen catch fish. Uh, and the three main practices are drift nets, long lines, and bottom trawling. And I'm going to look at each of those in turn. So let's start with drift nets. It's probably the, well, it isn't probably, it is the main way in which fish are captured in, in the oceans. And basically what you have are these very, very huge, huge, huge nylon nets, very difficult for fish to see. Uh, the fishermen tend to put these things out at night when the fish have less likely to have seen them. And they basically, the fish swim in and their gills get stuck in them, which sometimes called gill nets. And these, uh, Basically, these things can be like 90 kilometers long, and they hang down from the surface to a depth of about 15 meters. Uh, and, you know, depending on the fish they're trying to target, they can put them at different depths. But the bottom line is you have these huge curtains of, of gillnut out there, and, and any time a fish swims into it, it gets its gill stuck in there. And then they just, in the morning, they reel that thing in, and they just take out all the fish, and, you know, they, they get a lot of fish that way. Um, but one of the biggest problems with all forms of fishing, and especially uh, with um, uh, drift netting, is that you get a high percentage of what's called bycatch. So bycatch just means when you catch an organism that wasn't your target fish. So let's just say we're going out there and we're after, uh, I don't know, let's say we're after mackerel, okay? But, you know, we didn't mean to catch this shark. We catch this shark, well, sh shoot, you know, now we don't want it. So what do we do? Just throw it overboard in most cases. So these non-target bycatch fish are usually just tossed over the side. And there's a lot of them. So there's a, a lot of, of, of fish killed for no reason other than the fact they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, and, and because of where these are often deployed, they tend to be looking for pelagic fish, ones that swim near the surface. Well, that's where a lot of air-breathing marine animals live. So we're talking things like birds, marine mammals, seals, dolphins, whales, turtles. So there's, there's a lot of air-breathing animals that get caught in these, and obviously they'll drown when they do. And so uh, there's a lot of concern about these. And, and to be honest, a lot of times this is something that really gets people upset. You know, we, we really like, I mean, I'm sorry to share this picture, we really like seals, we really like dolphins, we really like turtles, and we see them dead. It seems to impact us more than we see dead fish. The bottom line is there's a lot of uh, unnecessary killing that goes on using these nets. So they're very uh, indiscriminate ways of catching fish. The other problem is they're they're very durable. They're they're not uh, biodegradable, and so these and this is you know this picture I have is not a very good one because this is actually showing a hemp net which will break down over time. But most of them are nylon, and they just don't break down. They last for years and years and years. And if 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 a part of that ninety kilometer net breaks loose, it just drifts across the ocean for years, decades. You know, just and and it just keeps killing and killing and killing, and nobody they, they don't know where it is anymore. And so these ghost nets are are a real problem in the world oceans. And so far, we really haven't come up with much of a plan for how to deal with them. Now, another way of catching a lot of fish is to use what's called a long line. And that's your traditional, you know, a piece of bait on a hook and you put it overboard. But instead of having a fishing point, you're just kind of catching it one at a time. You have these, when we say long line, we're talking about like 45, 50 kilometers worth of fishing line on which you have hundreds, thousands of, of these baited hooks that the, you, you deploy, you know, a lot of times you put it at night with a light on it, whatever, but it's like you're attracting fish and then you just reel it in and you just take all the fish off of there. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit less indiscriminate than, than um, uh, uh, the, the drift nets. Uh, however, it's still, there's still a bit of bycatch involved. You know, you don't always catch fish that you can sell and you don't always catch fish. Sometimes you catch birds. Uh, sometimes you catch turtles. You know, you, you, there, there's definitely things you catch that you don't need to catch it. To be sure, there's there's less of it than there is with drift nets, uh, but there's still a, a, an unfortunate amount of it. 
And then the third type, and probably the worst really, is known as bottom trawling. Now, there are two, two, two kinds of trawling. Trawling just means to drag a net behind a boat. Now, you can drag what's called like a, a per seine or something like this, where you just drag it to the water and lift it up. And again, there'll be, there'll be bycatch, but it's just it's one way of, of taking a smaller amount of ocean and, and taking the fish out of it. But unfortunately, a lot of the, the high value fish are ones that live along the bottom, like say cod and grouper or snapper. And so uh, what they do is they tend to have these weights that go to all the way to the bottom and they just drag these nets across the bottom. The problem is, in addition to having bycatch, you have a lot of destruction of habitat that goes along with this. So uh, bottom trawling is, is, has been very damaging to certain fisheries, uh, especially if there's a like, coral involved, it's just terrible. Uh, uh, another thing too is, is so, sometimes there are again with, with some surface trawling for say shrimp, um, they tend to catch a lot of air breathing animals like turtles, uh, and so as a result, uh, you know the EPA, the, the Environmental Protection Agency, has uh, insisted that uh, shrimp fishermen in the United States put in these things that uh, release turtles so they get caught. And so I mean there's there's regulations we can put in place that help the problem, uh, but it's worth knowing that that overfishing. Uh, is definitely an issue affecting the world's oceans because it's the tragedy of the commons. Nobody owns the oceans. And if you're a fisherman, you know, well, the more fish I catch, the more money I make. And, and I better go out there and catch more fish. Otherwise, the other guy's going to do it. So I'm, I, you know, I'm motivated to do it. But there's really no motivation to not do it unless there's a government regulation telling me not to do it. And even then, I might try to find a way around it. What we find is all the data we've collected uh, over the decades have shown there's been very marked declines in fish populations around the world because, you know, as technologies for catching fish improve uh, and as the demand improves, as the world gets bigger, more mouths to feed, we just see these, these steep declines in the world's fisheries. Now, you know, governments are concerned about it. And so they've tried to, you know, they, they, you know if, if they run out of fish, then the fishermen are impacted by it and the, the population goes without fish. So it's not that governments have been trying to solve this problem. Uh, so so it, it basically comes down to tragedy that comes. The more fish you catch, the more profit you make. So, you know, why would you not go out and get as many fish as you possibly could? Well, that's why you need a government to regulate it. So basically, let's say the case of the grand banks. Okay, so so the grand banks is, um, I mentioned this in the, in the Treasury of the Commons video. It's basically a cod fishery off eastern um, uh, Nova Scotia uh, in uh, Canada. And it was an amazingly, amazingly productive, one of the world's richest fisheries. And they bottom fish. So what they did, they, they bottom trawled and they just basically caught all the fish and they destroyed all the habitat. And basically, overfishing happens when you extract fish at a faster rate than which they multiply. So, so basically, it's like carrying capacity. You've exceeded carrying capacity. If, if, you, if you take them out of the ocean at a rate that's less than that which they multiply, well, you know what? They'll, they'll, they'll always be fish. Unfortunately, what happens is when you exceed that, these populations plummet. And if we damage the habitat in the process of doing that, those populations may not come back. Now, <clears throat> the good news is governments can play an important role here. So let's look at what happened with the Canadian government. First of all, the Canadian government is responsible for the, the plummet of that fishery. They, they didn't do a very good job of setting realistic targets. They were too lenient on the fishermen because they didn't want to upset them and, and upset their livelihood, which is understandable when you're a politician, you don't want to make people mad. But unfortunately, by not having stringent enough regulations, everybody lost out because the fish went away. Well, you know, because they, they aren't extinct. So we see here is a graph of, look, you know, so look what happened as the abundance went down, they put in, they put in, in place uh, uh, laws to regulate. And as the laws, uh, limited the amount of fish caught, the populations came back up. Okay, so basically uh, the harvest rate was getting high and we put these laws in place. Then what happened is the harvest rate went down and the fish population comes back. Now, another thing that's happened is uh, the United Nations uh, put in place a thing called the, uh, the Convention of the Law of the Sea, uh, UNCLOS. Okay, basically what it says is, is um, in order to reduce the tragedy of the commons, we'll say, look, well, uh, a, a, a country would feel like it owns its coastal waters. And at first, the coastal waters only extended out 12 miles, and everything else was just the world's ocean. So the tragedy of the commons was just happening. Everybody, you know, if you're a Russian fishing boat, you just go anywhere you want in the world and just take it Chinese, Korean, American, whatever, you just go wherever you want, make all the money you could. 
So they said, well, let's extend it out 200 miles. Because let's face it, remember, the open ocean is a bit of a desert. There's not much nutrients to, to, to keep fish alive. Most fish live within 200 miles of the shore. So by doing this, you encourage countries to have a stake in the survival of the, of the fish species there. And it's, it's been very powerful. So, so countries can impose regulations. Now, there's poaching that happens, to be sure. And there's, there's, there's cheating that happens. And there's... You know, there's corruption, but it is helping. And this is the best way to do it. Basically, the only way to fight tragedy of the commons is through regulations and, and, and for a sense of ownership. And that's why uh, the UNCLO was pretty important in that regard. Now, there's another important uh, convention, and that is the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species, CITES. Now, that may not seem like a great way of reducing overfishing, but some fish species are particularly endangered. Take bluefin tuna or uh, shark uh, for shark finish soup, certain corals that were sold as jewelry. Uh, so basically, uh, a lot of governments and up to 180 governments and tribal agencies, whatever, have all agreed that we're not going to trade in endangered organisms so that we're, we're, we're not going to allow people to buy them. We're going to put laws in place to prevent this from happening. And when it can be shown that a species is in danger by overfishing, you can use this um, agreement to implement reforms. And it has been fairly successful. Uh, so, so basically, the, my message to you is this, the only way to curtail tragedy of the commons is through governmental regulation. The problem with the ocean is it's not owned by any one person. And so by, by extending our, our coastal uh, boundaries of ownership rights uh, and by uh, by uh, trying to get people to agree not to trade in things that are already too endangered, we have managed to reduce this somewhat and hopefully we'll continue to do well in the future. In